Hello, book lovers, and welcome to another edition of our book club. That's right, Marissa Serafini and I. Today, we are dissecting Imagining Argentina, a novel by Lawrence Thornton, as it says so on the cover. And uh, just to orient those joining for the first time, each and every month, Marissa and I read a book, and then we talk about it. So we're going to talk about the context of it. We're going to go into the spoilers of it. Uh, we'll preview what we're going to be reading next. And we'll also, towards the end, highlight some of the books that we're reading outside of our required reading, quote unquote. And as always, we invite you to participate, you know, check out at this point, uh, quite a number of episodes that we've done a year, year's worth. So one per each month certainly is there. Um, we accept recommendations and stuff like that. So we want this to be a particip participatory sort of a thing. So mm -hmm. just for some context, and then I'll kick it to you. Um, Imagining Argentina for me, it was this book that, you know, each month we select a book, you know, I select one, Marissa selects one. So this was my book and very much so I walked into my local bookstore, the Iliad, uh, shout out to them. And, you know, I very much judged a book by its cover. <laughs> I just saw this. It has a, if you're watching on the video side, it has a very interesting design. You can of course uh, Google the title. And so I was like, all right, I don't know what this is, but this is intriguing. And yeah. Argentina is a country that I'm fascinated by. I don't know too much about it, but it was literally a toy coin toss between Colombia and Argentina as far as where I was going to film my second movie. So we went with Colombia. So Argentina has kind of been on the back burner in terms of getting me going. And yeah, that's the reason I selected this. But before I give any of my thoughts on the actual book, I want to toss it over to you, Marissa. Yeah, I mean, I had never heard of the author, um, Lawrence Thornton, but it's so funny when I was mentioning that I was reading this book to my dad, he was like, oh, yeah, I, I definitely recognize the name. I was like, oh, OK, so maybe it's just the different generations. I mean, this book was written, what, the 70s? So um, it's I think an 87, older... 87, yeah, 87, about the 70s. Um, it's an older book, not quite uh, in my purview, uh, usually. But like you said, very colorful. Um, and I actually bookmarked and and marked up this book of where like the the visual aspect. Uh, I I really enjoyed the visual aspect of this book. Like I could, quote unquote, to be totally punny, um, imagine all these situations. Um, once we get into the the stories and the recollections of um, telling people's tales and stuff like that. But it was so beautifully written out i could visually see it in front of me um and I, I really enjoyed that and i found that very engaging and i marked the points where i thought that i was like oh don't want to forget that because that's actually important and it's also relevant to the visual book cover so we'll Absolutely. get all into it i did enjoy this uh i, I think had we not read 100 years of solitude beforehand um, and that really introducing the magic realism that we find that recurring literary theme that we find within Latino, um, you know, culture in that way, I would have been lost, more lost in this book. Uh, but because we know that's such a style, uh, I was like, all right, it's, it's this so you kind of, again, have to disconnect a little bit, suspend your disbelief and be like, yep just go with it just go with it and it'll eventually make sense yeah and certainly you know we, we've now tr we're traveling the globe we've done indian magic realism we've done colombian magic realism now we're on yeah. to argentina and i would say to me this is some of the more grounded stuff simply because you know you, you can sort of look at like spirituality and kind of like i mean he's, he's essentially tapping into and seeing what's happening in real life right um so out of all those three and we'll get into it more but this to me feels the most grounded and it's actually very short i mean it's it's only about 200 pages give or take i mean yeah. i think it literally ends before the 200th page nah 215 whatever yeah uh, to 14 um, but uh because it's such a very rich book um in terms of its history i do want to kind of take a couple of steps back and start with the author and then also talk about the context of where this book takes place before we actually get to the book. So Lawrence Thornton actually is not Argentinian whatsoever. <laughs> he hails from Claremont, California. Um, he was born in 1937. And this is actually his debut novel. 
And uh, along with naming the spirits and tales from the Blue Archives, they make up his Argentina trilogy. Um, and as it so goes, he was an English professor who was, uh, he saw a CBS segment um, on 60 Minutes about Argentina's dirty war, which we're going to talk about. And he was really fascinated by this. And so that's what spurred him on to write about this subject matter, because I was very curious of like, wait, what's your context for this, <laughs> right? Like, why did you choose mm -hmm. to write this? And um, so, yeah, that's what kind of spurred him on. And uh, I haven't uh, read uh, Naming the Spirits or Tales from the Blue Archives, but um, Tales from the Blue Archives in particular um, sounds interesting to me because it father follows the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, which we'll talk about, but that's a very prominent sort of um, activist group, has been around for many, many years and world renowned. And, you know, that to me is a very fascinating story um, and seems more grounded in reality. So that one in particular, I'd be very interested to read. Um, but yeah, you know, he's, he taught at University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and yeah, overall, um, just the sort of that sort of typical writer, professor, scholar, you know, he wrote for the New York Times book review as well. Um, as far as like his books, he doesn't have many out, but, um, uh, you know, each of them do come highly acclaimed. And Imagining Argentina itself actually was turned into a movie starring Antonio Banderas, which wasn't, I actually did not see because <laughs> I chose not to see it because it wasn't very well reviewed. It's got like 33% on Rotten Tomatoes. So I was like, maybe I'll just, uh, yeah, it's pretty low. Um, and apologies for turning this into somewhat of a lecture, but let me just kind of get into the dirty war to set the context of this. Um, and obviously this is a very brief truncated history, but just to set the tone, the dirty war is the name used by, um, the military, um, dictatorship for a period of state terrorism in Argentina from 1974 to 1983 as a part of Operation Condor, during which military and security forces uh, essentially tried to get out the um, political descendants that were left-leaning, uh, socialist, and so forth, right? And it is estimated anywhere between 9,000 to 30,000 people were either killed or disappeared um, in these acts of terrorism. Very hard to state because it's undocumented, right? Um, the only sort of documentation that kind of exists is thanks to the mothers of Plaza de Mayo is because they, they were the ones being like, hey, my daughter, my son, my family members, they're missing, right? And so that's how the records were essentially formed um, in all of this. But um, the interesting aspect too is that, um, as always, the U.S. does have a hand in this because it later came out that U.S. Uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger you know, he actually did back Argentina's military rulers. Um, this came out obviously way later um, in 1987. And so the book was finished before that. So it couldn't even have been brought into that. But it's it's interesting to, you know, the, the book itself is very humanized and from the perspective of the people that lived through it. But it is interesting to one of the reasons I love books like this is it, it, it forces you to think about the larger context of our world, right? Mm -hmm. And you can certainly make similarities to past, present, and future. Um, and so that'll be exciting to sort of touch upon. So, yeah. Right. And I think that's, uh, yeah. Um, just thank you for that, that brief update about the, you know, the dirty war, because the eighties, uh, there was a lot of political <laughs> warfare going on. We had, you know, that and, you know, the Iran Contra affair. Um, um, so like we had a lot of political um, upheavals it de definitely during the Reagan administration. And then like, this is like still around the same time. Um, so, and like, and those were like all different countries and um, all over the world. So, um, politics were definitely, definitely a timely thing. And this book was written in the 80s. So it's definitely <laughs> in the zeitgeist. So it, it makes it now makes sense why he wrote it, because like you said, like, oh, how did you yeah, you're an American, but you're writing about an Argentinian story and culture. And like you wonder, how did he get the inspiration for that? It's just I think it was just because that's where the world state was, because um, that uh, a lot of political factors were happening all over 
So, and I think it, um, I, I think he did a good creative way of being like, oh, how can we get into the minds of people who who are actually going through that or who went through that? Like, if we had a way to connect ourselves into literally the the trauma of like what's happening during these wars, um, it, it kind of gives a reader and just people's insights of like, oh, maybe we can like maybe understand what they're going through a little bit. And you can see that in this writing. Absolutely. And so, you know, that that's something that I want to pose a question to you. So in essence, it is a book about this man named Carlos who loses his wife and eventually his daughter. And he's has these premonitions, if you will, about what happened to the people. And some of it is gruesome. Others of it leads to a happy ending. But overall, to me, the theme of it is the importance of telling stories and that art and storytelling is not meaningless and so forth. But, you know, using that, did, was that sort of your central theme? Because I know you gravitate towards the imagery, but if not, what was it? Yeah, I think it's also the importance of storytelling because that was what everybody loved about Carlos is that he was such a good storyteller. And that's why people were listening to him because he was a great orator. And we know this was like still when internet wasn't around, cell phones weren't around. Like the only way to really get like news across was via word of mouth or television. And we don't really have technology in this book. So it's really just the the form of communication from person to person. And that the fact that this became a bigger problem and it was affecting so many different people, but he was connected. This one seemingly random guy was connected to everybody. And he was such a good communicator. People listened to him. Um, there, It says a lot when someone can actually like get a point across and people listen and engage. And that was the importance of Carlos because it's like, no, something's happening here. Someone believe me. And you could tell that because he was such a good communicator and you know he wasn't lying. So there, there was like credibility and truth to him and people kept going back to him. And he was causing an enough stir like, oh, maybe we should take him seriously. Yeah. And certainly, you know, there was enough indication here and there that that justified his um, premonitions as being true. And the interesting part, too, you know, in terms of the communication, yes, you had television, stuff like that, and you had newspapers, but those were mainly controlled by the government. And certainly his wife, she wrote for the newspaper. And she, the reason why she disappeared was she she wrote something that they did not like. And so right. in going back to that sort of primal, you know, face to face interaction. Um, yeah, it, it, just something about that is, I don't know, I found it very intriguing especially as like passing down stories, right? Because there's the family who had survived the Holocaust and the importance of like just telling stories, you know, as a way to remember people, you know, mm -hmm. and the importance yeah, of that. And, and I think that's why we have so many stories now is because they're generally back then, you know, that's how stories got passed down was from person to person, word of mouth, word of mouth. And like you said, yeah, the, the wife was um, a journalist. And we can see how technology and how written papers or like the media failed them because God forbid they went against the media. They, they went against, um, they were, you know, uh, dissenters. And that that worked against them to the point where they got kidnapped. So like the only way that they could really get their truths across was only via mouth. Yeah. And um, I mean, certainly towards the end, right? Like that's how I mean, we just live in a completely different age. And some, you know, it's always interesting what tracks through social media and what ultimately doesn't. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, you know, Amnesty International, if there is like a glimmer of a happy ending in this book, it's that Amnesty International got wind of what was going on and kind of, you know, stepped in. Um, and but but let's let, let's dive into the wife in particular, because she goes through some horrific stuff and yet she maintains her humanity and her unwavering nature. So I wanted to, you know, right. I want to get your thoughts on her because she goes, she goes through a lot. She does. And I felt for her. And honestly, I kind of felt like they ended her character a, a little bit at the end where like, no, but I want to know more about her. <laughs> like, does she have to go through therapy or, you know, this is a traumatic experience. But I think that shows with the the recurring theme of just like the human spirit. 
um, and the resilience of people when you're going through traumatic experience together with other people, like you have a better chance of surviving, you have a better chance of overcoming um, diversity in that way. And I think that shows that this woman got herself involved because she was she was already caring about other kids. Um, these missing kids, she was already invested. Hey, she knew something was wrong. She got involved, in, unfortunately. But I think it's because I think that was her character. Like, she was already a caring person. So you can tell she's already, like, more emotionally stable or more emotionally mature. And I think people who tend to be, actually, statistically, people who tend to be higher educated um, deal with life trauma better, generally deal um, and like have a better chance of being like more successful, even through trauma. Um, they, they, they're they just better at um, coping with it. And I think she's one of those people because she's educated, because she's smart, because she has a high emotional EQ. Um, she ended up fortunately, unfortunately for like she went through all this stuff. But like at the end of the day, you know, she's going to be OK. Yeah. And I mean, she definitely like physically she suffered. Right. And it's it's depicted in no uncertain terms multiple times what she suffers. Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, to just say like, oh, she was raped a number of times does a a huge injustice. And yet that's what it was. Um, And yet through that, you know, she she maintains her resolve. And as I recall it, you know, when, when Carlos's spirit was wavering through their like communication, somehow she was the one, like, just keep telling stories. Don't worry about me. Keep Mm -hmm. telling stories. And for her to do that, um, yeah, just shows how much she's like, she's willing to take physically, you know, and not waver. And as you said, in the mental aspects of any of it. Right. And she was the one who's going through the trauma, but yet she still ended up being the one who was comforting Carlos instead of Carlos comforting her. And um, so props to her. Good on you, woman, um, for for still like being strong through trauma. Um, But I think that it also shows like just how strong their bond and relationship was that they even though they're both, you know, suffering mentally and physically, they're both keeping each other motivated, literally keeping each other alive. Yeah. I mean, it's now that I think about it, it's a somewhat of a dichotomy where she's suffering physically, but mentally she's strong. He's to me overall suffering more mentally and physically, you know, yes, he gets tired and stuff like that, but come on, that's, that's nothing compared to her, you know? So it's a kind of that counterbalance. That's interesting to, to know as I think about it. Right. And I think you of all people knows the importance of mental fortitude. <laughs> and we see Cecilia, she she is a person who has a lot of that. So, yeah. And I think that's what kept I'm so glad that both of them survived in this, because if Cecilia actually died, I think I would have thrown the book. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah. why did we go through all this for her to not live? I, I honestly I'd be pissed. Um, so uh, I'm glad that it had a happy ending for her, especially after Carlos was saying all these unhappy endings for other people. Um, so, like, I really didn't know Cecilia's fate. And I, I was generally concerned for her. I was like, we really don't know if she's going to live. Well, especially because, like, the daughter, Teresa, she did not have a happy ending herself. And that was one of those, like, as I was reading the book, I was like, why is Teresa still here? She needs to like, she needs to go, go mm. like, this is too dangerous. And uh, my, unfortunately, my, my, my worries were vindicated. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on Teresa, the daughter. I mean, it, I, I think it's just shown that the fact that Carlos not only lost just one person, like he, he lost a lot of people. So this is definitely affecting him. And it's, he lost two women too. And I, I think not to say like, that losing men is also important or it's like not important, but the fact that it's a, it's his wife and daughter is like literally his whole family. Um, that's all he has left other than himself. So I think it just kind of raises the, the level of jeopardy and how important it is to him because it seems like everybody else, they're pointing the fact that 
everybody's missing. They're very aware people are missing, but no one's taken the initiative to do something about it. Or and like while I was reading, I was like, are you witnessing these people missing or are you just literally realizing they're missing? I was like, if God forbid you're actually seeing someone get kidnapped, like are you actually like fighting against them and like trying to like hold them? I was like, because me, I don't know, me as a fighter, I would fight back. Um so for Carlos to have two people missing, it's like, no, he he's the only person who's actually like actively telling other people and doing something about it. And he's actively making the search for people because I just kept feeling like everyone's like, yeah, these people are missing, but I'm not doing anything about it. Yeah. And, you know, um, there is there's certainly a theme of just the women in general being the strongest among them. You know, we talked about the actual history of the mothers, um, the uh, of the Plaza de Mayo, where essentially that's where the government building was. And, you know, it'd be like uh, protesting outside the White House or something like that, or Capitol, right? Yeah. Um, that's what the equivalent of that is. And, you know, it was actually them that were there every, every you know, week and Carlos joined them rather than him being the galvanizing force. And so, um, yeah, one of the, certainly when Cecilia gets taken, the neighbors just kind of watch, but don't even inform Carlos, really. They're like, oh, well, something happened. Right. And that's what I'm saying. It's like people are aware things are happening. I was like, are you fighting back? Are you calling the police? Are you doing something as good as I know you have telephones? Or like, are you actually actively doing something about it? Rather than just like sit there and be like, oh, what, what can we do? They're missing now. Not my problem. Like that, I think I was just more of, frustrated that people weren't taking the initiative and Carlos seemingly was the only one who was doing something about it. Well, I think that was the big, you know, he was the catalyst that again, he just kind of recognized more things. So she, he saw the mothers and knew that they needed support. Um, and he recognized that ultimately the military themselves, they don't have the numbers and they're actually more feel fearful than we are. Right. Because the power of the military and that perspective was, hey, you shut up, you fear for your life because what we just did, that'll happen to you as soon as you open your mouth. And so the resistance, right, um, mm -hmm. it shows is, yeah, keep telling stories and, you know, um, just kind of dissent in that way. Because if, if you give in to what they're trying to, then you've given them the, the power, you know? Right. And like, I mean, and that's, that's just terrorism, you know, that's instilling fear within a community. Um, and like, God forbid you give into the fear. And I guess you, you can give Carlos credit too, for not giving in, um, being mentally stable in that way too, that like he, his way of fighting against it was just to keep telling stories, even though he knew the, the risk of, you know, rattling all the wrong chains. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I think the visit to the Pampas, um, which is like basically a very crappy part of um, Argentina, it's where a lot of the people were supposedly kept. Certainly uh, his wife was kept in that area. Um, you know, he has a, as grim as it is, he has a tra transcendent experience that makes him keep going and not give up. Um, and, you know, through that, he ends up meeting Solomon, which is a little bit more indirect than I'm giving it credit for, but Solomon, who is a Nazi survivor. And to me, that was a very key connection because um, that's what allowed Carlos to really realize, you know, history does repeat itself. And the way out of this is to not give in, you know? Yeah. Um, the the hope, you know, we saw a lot of that Esperanza. Um, yeah. And it, it's just terrible that like, even like, from this story to the Holocaust, this only with us like what a few years, you know, a few decades. Um, and the fact that they're like so close to each other, but we know that there's hope because of Solomon. There's like, oh, there's a chance for survivors if you, you just keep pushing through. Um, they could have that that happy ending. And Solomon was like a living um proof that something good can come out of an unfortunate situation. And then like, I think he was a good person that kept when Carlos didn't have his wife, he had Solomon to also help push him. 
Yeah, I think, you know, it both highlighted the hopefulness all, all of it, but but it also in an interesting way, it showed to me the fragility of how easily this stuff can happen. I mean, I don't want to go down too far a rabbit hole, but like certainly, you know, plenty will argue that there's indicators of all of this, not necessarily people getting kidnapped, um, certainly not on this level, but like that even within the US, like there's movements happening and it's not good, right? And so yeah. I think that bifurcation to think that, uh, you know, what the Nazis did and stuff like that, oh, that'll never happen again or whatever. And it's like, eh, it, it can happen pretty easily, unfortunately. It can happen again in a different way. It's like paint a different color and call it something else, but it's still like the same. You're still instilling discrimination and fear. And it, it might not be against the Jews, but it's against a political race. So, I mean, call it a different color. Um, but the, the, the end result is the fact that it's like there's this major injustice happening and it's affecting a, a large amount of people that don't deserve this. And it is, it's called something else, but it's still, again, history repeating itself. It's like, what can we do to fight against that? Um, we know that we people came out of the Holocaust, so we know that people can come out of this. Yeah, and and it really is, like I said, I mean, to me, just the storytelling aspect, it really is that aspect that no matter what happens, stories are important, um, you know, whether someone lives or unfortunately dies, the memory of keeping that alive is equally as important as the event itself, if not more so, because the event happens in the blink of an eye, but with the story, it can be repeated multiple times and a lesson can be gleaned from it. Um, real quick, I, I do want to mention that uh, the story is not told through Carlos's perspective. It's actually told through Martine, who is our narrator. Mm -hmm. And I like that disconnect because you know, we don't quite dive into the mind of Carlos, and yet we dive pretty closely because we imagine it's relayed from Carlos. I mean, multiple times Carlos does speak his mind to Martin. So I just want to touch upon that and get your perspective on the structure of it, if you will. Right. But I think it's very fitting because we're, like, we're getting another story. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. getting a story that's passed on from Carlos. And had that story not been told properly, then, you know, like, you know, if you played the telephone game, details change, things are different from why it originally started. But the importance of telling a truthful story and the fact it's still being told to the next person, now it's being told to us as the reader. And now we're telling you guys, whoever's listening to us, story to the next story to the next story. It's a story within a story. Um, I like that structure. Uh, it, and it makes sense because... That's just how they set it up. And I I could still going with the theme of imagining, I can I can picture it all. Even yeah. though it was told verbally, I can still visually see it. Yeah. And certainly, you know, storytelling becomes ultra important because Carlos decides to put on this play, um, honoring essentially all those lost, and pretty much immediately the theater which is a children's theater of all things is shut down. And it, you know, in that sense, the power of art is really illustrated, right? And in some sense, if you control culture through art, you can control many minds, right? So yeah, um, yeah that, that was fascinating. And, and, and that's when I, I almost feel like, I mean, certainly there's a lot of things that made Carlos suffer in that moment, but as soon as the theater went, he suffered. Yeah, it was like he, he lost his wife and his daughter. Now he's losing the theater. Um, yeah, and I, I think it just shows like he was losing everything all at once and very, very quickly. Uh, but I, I think it, it's it's terrible to say it's like sometimes you have to lose everything to realize what you have. But I think it just gave him more motivation. Like, no, I lost all this. Now I'm more um, determined to get it all back or at least talk to the people, tell people about it so we can do something to get it back. Yeah, and two things with that. Number one, when they did reopen the theater, he made the conscious choice to, he's like, no, 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 it's going to stay kind of like this. The, 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 the marks and, and it being torn apart and beaten 
that is a reminder of the past. So we're not just going to mm -hmm. paint over it and make it all pretty as if nothing happened. We will allow the reminder of the past to live on. Um, and also speaking to like, you know, just the mothers of, of the plaza and him in general, what I appreciated was as as it may be, right? Like I think a lot of times when it comes to activism, we get so overwhelmed. Well, like, what can I do, right? We feel like we have to either solve the problem and if we can't, then we just don't do anything, right? And it's like, listen, all you can do is all you can do. And that's it. You know what I mean? You just have mm -hmm. to take the tiniest actions, whatever it may be, and know that that has to be good enough. And, and it, it, you know, you can affect a single person um, there and it can domino out from there. But without that initial spark, a mixing spark. metaphors, I know none of it will uh, do anything, right? So I, I, I don't know. I thought that was very poignant. No, I absolutely agree. It's like it only takes one person to start a movement. And um, finally, it, it seemed like Carlos was finally getting people on board to actually talk to the right, eventually get to the right people, which led to the uh, alliance that finally were the right people who, who you know, helped resolve this. So I, it's again, it's the power of communication. It's the power of just having the initiative to start something and he was that person and i feel like maybe it's just me as a reader it, it i got so frustrated that other people just had this defeatist mentality but carlos wasn't wasn't that he's like no let's do something and like i tend to gravitate towards people who take the initiative yeah absolutely um i'm curious speaking of that i do want to touch upon the ending because it seems like a very bittersweet ending. On the one hand, you know, things, you know, people are reunited as best as they can be. Certainly, at least Carlos and his wife, Cecilia, are. Um, and as Mar Martin's looking out the, uh, the window, there's a sense of like odd relief where it's like, okay, it's in some ways over and people are ready to move on. But should they? <laughs> Question mark. Right. Or it's more so like they should move on, but they shouldn't forget. And then again, I think that comes with the importance of stories, the importance of um, remembering, like like you said, Ben, with the theater, Carlos didn't want to forget the history. He, they could have knocked the whole thing down and rebuilt it new, but he's like, no, this is part of our history. Let's not forget it. So again, with the, the storytelling, how important it is, now we're hearing stories of people's past and how that does how that did affect their present and future um i, I think it's just like the o to no they these people didn't die in vain it, if if you forget about them then what was the point yeah i mean it is kind of i grapple with like that balance right so the closest thing i can sort of come up with is like covid right in many ways not that covid's ever gone from this world but at least like the threat as it once was, is not there anymore, right? And we're getting back into life as it used to be and so forth. And and in a way that is just so relieving, right? Um, and you don't want to like look back on the past, but there's a lot of stuff to essentially <laughs> sort of unearth. And, uh, you know, I always say like the only reason to go in the past is to learn lessons from it. But it's like, in a way, it's like, if I never have to hear about COVID, <laughs> Right. You know, it'd be too soon, sort of thing. So it's it's, it's again, I'm, I'm gra I grapple with the balance myself, right? And I think it's like you totally, I totally understand that. It's like you want to just keep moving forward and keep living your life, but also you can't forget the impact of your past, uh, of the history, or like what it did for us, or um, the you know, because I mean that <laughs> it that turned economics and you know racism like upside down. Um, so it's like a lot of bad things came out of it, but now we're past that hump. We can move forward, but don't forget about it, but let's move forward. And I think it's the same thing with Carlos. Like, let's not forget about it, but let's keep living our lives. Yeah. And again, that's tough because like, just, you know, however strong you are mentally, like, and physically, it all just does take a toll on you. You know what I mean? And like, um, you know, you talked about Cecilia needing therapy, like, there's not a doubt in my mind. Listen, however strong she may be, Girl. she would definitely benefit from some therapy. 
Yeah, you therapy know. and a, a nice long hug. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and, and I don't know, maybe it's just the woman in me. I was like, oh, do you need someone to talk to? Do you need a friend? I'll, I'll be here for you. Um, because like she she went through a legit traumatic experience. And like, that's why I was like, oh, I want to know what happened to her afterwards. <laughs> How is she really coping? Like, yeah, she was strong throughout it. But is she still strong at the end of it, after it? Um, yeah. So, but like, I, I like to think that she is considering like what her character was throughout the the whole story but uh, yeah and like and that's just one person and yeah. it, it affected thousands of people and for so clarity like, know, like yeah for me for clarity like her let's say like she got out of this and then all of a sudden she like broke down in tears and like you know got the hug she needed right that to me is still a sign of strength you know that is not weakness and right. you know um certainly the book highlights the importance of community, right? I mean, you know, we've been talking about the storytelling aspect of it, but this movement grows and grows. And in that sense, there's a shared pain, right? And so as hurtful as it is, there is a sigh of relief, you know, of like, okay, at least I'm not the only one. Yeah. And Trauma bonding. In a way, yeah. it really in is. In a way, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yes, you're correct. <laughs> yeah, I but like, I guess I guess the question is, would you rather not trauma bond? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like it's a it's a weird question for sure. I mean, it's more like it's it's unfortunate that they have the trauma bond. You know? Yeah. Um, it's like can't they bond over something happy? Uh, yeah. No, I I get that, but it, I think it's like when everyone goes through something terrible together, that actually makes them stronger. So. Uh, and now that we, you know, uh, these people, the people that fortunately, you know, did survive, like we have that, again, reoccurring hope of theme that they have a better future. And yeah. they have the ability to tell stories that pass it on to their, um, the next generation. Oh, yeah. That um, that also reminds me, like, there's a reason why I marked up my books and I don't, didn't want to forget it. Just the importance of um, the the generations and the birds Mm -hmm. um i don't know if you wanted to talk about yeah, that because like the the cover we we do have the parrots and um the different argentinian birds that you find but um what i really enjoyed about this is that uh in the latin culture um that birds tend to be uh have the spirit of past descendants um and the importance of names the importance of family and we have to take care of them because they'll keep coming back to us. Um, and if we don't, if we cage them up, if we lock them away, like they will die. Um, so like just the the metaphor of um, keeping stories going, keeping descendants, keeping the importance of names being passed down from generation to generation, story to story. Um, I like that. Um, I, you know, I really did enjoy that. And I don't know that that, that really stuck out to me because they the birds had it, it was a recurring thing and the birds came in a lot just like the, there were scenes where the birds were just sitting there and some were sickly some were healthy some were colorful and bright, vibrant and some weren't and just like that's your family you have to take care of your family yeah and i mean just nature in general right even just the description of the trees and and so forth um was very important right and yeah, I, I really appreciate that because it shows a oneness. And, you know, certainly from Carlos, like he was essentially able to tap into that um, aspect of it. And that's what revealed the truth, you know, like, in a sense, nature can reveal a lot to us, we just choose not to listen, in many ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the aspect that, uh, as I really thought about it, um, you know, trying to put myself in as much as possible into the shoes that that are there, right? Um, I think that the hard part, right, when, in trying to build a community is you have to have the time, right? Even story, and, and in a sense, like them making the time to tell stories and, and sitting there and so forth, you know, is a conscious act, right? But amidst essentially just trying to survive day to day, right? Like when I look at our modern lives, um, you know, I know so many people that would be willing to help and vice versa, but it's like, most of us are like, just honestly, just trying to get through our day. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? right. And so that's the difficulty of all of it. Um, is just, you're beaten to a pulp by just call it the system, what you want. And yeah, that's what makes it hard, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and fight in spite of that. Yeah. 
That's why you have to applaud Carlos because despite being tired, despite everybody else's mentality being like, there's nothing I, we can do. He's like, no, let's do it. You know, he he had, and, and you know, fortunately he had Cecilia, he had Solomon to help also push him because there he had his moments where he almost gave up too. So, you know, it, it only takes one person. And it's interesting because Martin himself was skeptical a lot of times he's like is this guy just driving himself insane thinking that cecilia is alive like what if she's not alive or like or you're literally just imagining this just to as a self-soothing mechanism because you're in such denial that your wife is dead that you're imagining she's still alive um and again that that toes the the whole magic realism we're like, is he really hallucinating? I can't tell if he's telling the truth or he's just so in denial that that's the only way he can see and believe his wife is alive, that he has this desperate hope and attempt that I was like, no, she's kidnapped. She's still out there. She's still alive. And like to a normal person to be like, no, dude, accept it. She's gone. He's like, no, he was so determined, so adamant against it. So there, there's yeah. a lot of what ifs. <laughs> Certainly a lot of what ifs, but, and, and and that's why, like, I call this one the most grounded magic realism story, because that idea of just maintaining hope, I mean, there's plenty of people we can look at as examples of history that seemed quite delusional, and yet they were proven correct, right? However miraculous the act itself might seem, but, you know, in many ways, it was because of their unwavering nature, right? And so that to me, yeah, it it, it, it just kind of... It's like, I know there's a lot of fantastical elements to this story. But there's a lot of plot stuff we can actually apply to real life, you know? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I found that fascinating. And I think that's one of my worst fears is that like you believe in something so strongly that other people think you're insane, crazy, like me- like legit mentally unstable um, to the point that no one believes you. That's like kind of my worst fear <laughs> or like one of my worst fears is like that. You believe something so strongly that no one believes you. And then, I, that, then you have to question yourself. Oh, it's like, am I the crazy one? I don't know. That's a and space that, that I kind occupy of a lot. I occupy yeah. that space a lot where people like don't, they're like, wait, you're going to go film a movie in Columbia? I'm like, yep. Have you ever been? Nope. Nope. <laughs> you know, but, but like I, and I mean, here's the thing, like you still have to take the steps forward, right? Like Carlos, you know, had his weekly sessions for lack of a better term you know and so you do what's needed you have that belief but you still take steps forward and i think the disconnect for some people is like oh i just believe this and it'll happen it's like no you kind of have to there's there's still an element to it yeah right for sure yeah you Um, and i both know that (laughs) absolutely you know it's not just gonna magically (laughs) do itself (laughs) um Anything else about the book itself that you want to touch upon before we get into sort of the larger context of of things again? No, I I think um, I I definitely brought up the birds and it just like I liked how even though, you know, the author is American it still touched upon that um, that culture, Um, you know, the importance of birds. I didn't know that. I didn't know like birds had the spirit of past descendants and um you, you got to keep their spirits alive to keep, you know, and you, and you see like how we keep our own grandparents alive, you know, through memories, through videos, through whatever. And for, for this particular culture, it's like you, they stay alive through the birds. Absolutely. One thing I do want to touch upon real quick that I just realized. Um, so Martin was a journalist during Vietnam from about 65 to 69. And, um, you know, for him afterwards, he did, lose his son Tomas and his wife and him Elizabeth they split four years after losing their son so it's a interesting juxtaposition to Carlos because you know when we talked about Martin essentially questioning Carlos you can kind of see why like I mean he's seen humanity I mean Vietnam from all things that we've ever seen you know was hell on earth essentially another brutal war um Um, but also, we see Martin's mentality, like he lost his wife, he lost his child. And now we see Carlos losing his wife, losing his child. And we know because Martin didn't have a good outcome. He's already in that, 
mentality of like, oh, buddy, it didn't work out for me. Good chance it's not going to work out for you either. Yeah. So, so it is It is unfortunate, but um, at least a, a glimmer of a happy ending in this one. Yeah, um, for sure. So I just want to kind of highlight some documentaries for those interested in learning more about the Dirty War. Um, so there's one on YouTube that's available that's that's really good. The, the Dirty War, the Horrors of the Argentine Dictatorship. Um, it's about an hour um, and it's really well done. Uh, the Disappeared, which is a 2008 film by Peter Sanders. Um, there's one called Stolen Babies, Stolen Lives, which is a, movie, a documentary about three children stolen from Argentina's Dirty War and, um, you know, tells their story. And then uh, if you want to just kind of go more fictional route, there's the official story, which was a an Academy Award winner for the best foreign language movie. It's about um, the story of an upper class couple who lives in Buenos Aires, and they have an illegally adopted child, essentially trying to um, protect that, that, that child during this time. Right. And so I've not seen it, but, um, you know, it did win an Oscar. So looks pretty good. Oh. And that, that came out in 1985. So, okay. Um, got our homework cut up for us. Well, I, you know, I like to offer this stuff because, again, like I, I love books like this that, you know, intrigue you to want to learn more. Certainly, um, we'll talk about like um, I've already had the chance to read next month's book and uh, it deals with a lot of like biology and ecology. And I'm like, oh, this is all very interesting stuff. So I love mm -hmm. books that like expand your interests in those ways. So very exciting. Absolutely. But before we do that, let's talk about the books we've been reading. That's not yeah. been on our list. Uh, yeah, I've been, let's see. I've been, I finished a, uh, maybe it's been like, I don't know, I moved my life. So like, when did I read this book? I can't remember. Um, I'm currently reading The Rise of Kyoshi. This is an Avatar, um, leg, um, Avatar, The Last Airbender story universe. It's actually one of the previous Avatars before Aang. This is the Earthbender before Aang. Yeah, there's a whole series. Um, there's there's two books of Kyoshi's Avatar, and then there's two books of the Airbender Yang Chen, who was also the previous Airbender before uh, Aang and Korra. So um, I'm reading those uh, mostly because I've had them for over a year, but I just haven't gotten to them. And I was like, why not? I'm rewatching everything all at once, and they're just staring at me right in the face. So I was like, and then not a friend of mine told me everything where all, all at once. But. Yeah, no, not that one. <laughs> not that one. Um, I've just been like rewatching Korra here and there, Avatar here and there. And then my friend was telling me to finally read these because she had already read them. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do still have those books to read. So I'm uh, finally reading that one. And then, yeah, that's that's really the only one as of right now. I, I finished um, Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo. So and that was also a Taylor Jenkins read book as well. So, you know, a lot of just things here and there. Oh, cool. Well, the one that I've uh, been reading is The Love Dog by Tamar Geller. Um, and it, it will be obvious to you, Marissa, for you, dear listener, it's because uh, I've been fostering a dog and so wanted to kind of reacclimate into, you know, how to essentially take care of a dog. And uh -huh. this, that was an excellent book. And then other than that, um, you know, just kind of trying my best to move forward on on certain creative projects. So I've been like looking at visual companions. So like the Lord of the Rings Fellowship Companion, uh, The go. Return of the King Visual Companion. Um, we've got Final Fantasy and then we've got The Batman by Matt Reeves, you know, the art of that. And so, you know, not a lot of reading, but just amazing, cool pictures. So Yeah, visuals. That's visual reading. <laughs> I, I, I count that as reading. Um, yeah, I've been honestly, I've been reading a lot of fan fiction of other stories too. So I do, I do that in between. Um, yeah. Right on. Cool. Well, do you want to introduce next month's? Yeah, our next month is Barbara King Solver's Prodigal Summer. It's still technically summer by the time we read this book. Phil, you've actually read most of this so far. I have yet to read it. So you might actually. Have better insight to it than I do, but I, I'm I'm excited to read it. You know, it's stories of like three different characters and they're intertwined um, in the backdrops of the Appalachian Mountains. So yeah, it's a yeah. it's a fun book. Um, 
you know, it's, it's one of those, you kind of have to trust where it's heading, but by doing so the trust is, um, uh, it's, it's given, it's provided, you know, it's, it's rewarded. So I really, I really appreciate where it goes and, and what it reveals about humanity and, and so forth. So really great book. Yeah. And then, um, we're going to do this, uh, in September, but that's because by the time we actually record it, it will be like the end of September. And so right on, we'll be getting into Halloween season. So we're going to do Hocus Pocus and its sequel. Like, like that's literally the book. So like uh, free form, yeah. You know, novelized Hocus Pocus and then wrote a sequel, which is not the same as Hocus Pocus 2 on Disney Plus. So it'll be fun to, um, you know, I've already read it. Um, I think we'll just have a, I think Marissa, you'll have a blast reading. The I know I'm going to have a blast. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So that it's just fun and easy and, you know, getting us into the Halloween spirit. So, yeah. I, I still don't have a pick for October, mostly because I'm like towing the line between like two different stories and I'm kind of torn. So may, next month I'll have it uh, on hand for us awesome. because it will be October. It's either horror or thriller or either both. <laughs> so I'm like, which one do we want to read first? So, yeah, awesome. I'll let you know next month. And on my side reading, I'm, I'm kind of like... Um kind of want to dive into like a Tom Clancy or John Grisham novel it's just because I've never read either and like there you go. I don't know it All seems right. like you know a must in some sense I just want to read one I've definitely read Grisham um I haven't read Clancy but I've seen you know Jack Ryan and all that so yeah. uh yeah I, I'm definitely aware of both of those both awesome. of those writers well that does it for us today. Uh, we appreciate you joining us. We hope that, if nothing else, it has sparked your interest in uh, history and the power of stories and so forth. Uh, please let us know your comments, as mentioned, uh, you know, about the book itself. Any books that you're reading would be fun to know as well. And in the meantime, if they want to keep in contact with you, Marissa, where at? Everyone can follow me at Serafini TV. And my podcast, Friends and Favorites, with Marissa Serafini on iTunes. And you, there you can hear me talk about other people and the books that they love to read as well. Absolutely. It's a great series, and not only because I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm at Phil Speed Tech. We'll see you next time.